Okuma Media's Polity Amtabi Madiba. Joining me today is author Tabo Mulife, here to discuss his memoir titled Native Boy, Confessions of Emma Blazini in the City. Your book is an illuminating memoir of a young black man's search for identity set against the backdrop of a country in the throes of political transition. Can you please tell us more on what prompted you to write this memoir? In a word, uh, two incidents. One is natural. So it's the aging process. Uh, I think when you hit a certain age, you have more or equally ahead of you as much as my, you might have behind, right? So you begin to reflect. But the other was the incident described in the opening chapter of the book. Yes, so those two incidents, age and the incident itself, were actually what triggered my writing of the book to say, let me, let me just remember exactly what my life has meant and let me put it down on paper in a way where, because you know, as you age as well, the memory might, might, might not be there to be accessed perhaps 60 or maybe several years hence, so yes. But it was really about reflecting about my life uh, as a South African, a Black South African in particular, a book seemed to be the best way to do it. And racism in South Africa is widely regarded as an ongoing problem. Since the demise of apartheid, it remains a societal and institutionalized problem. Briefly mm -hmm. share with us some of the racist incidents that you encounter in your book. Well, I think the main one, particularly in childhood, was one where I was stuck in a vehicle, my father's car, with an AWB member, uh, kind of driving it and revving it up, if you like. Uh, I did not know at the time, obviously, that that guy belonged to AWB, the group. I think as a child also, you, you would not really understand why is it that my dad Okay, he's got this new car. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, me and my brother and my sister would like to come along, you know, as frequently as possible. But he doesn't want you to come along, right? And you think he's being unfatherly, right? But that incident that I described, I think, in the, in the second chapter, actually showed me that the reason why, whenever he was going into town, he wouldn't want me, my brother, or my sister to tag along was because he, would, he knew that being particularly at the center of town, there would be opportunities of various encounters with white people and, and that many of those wouldn't be pleasant, right? In fact, as I am speaking now, I can recall instances where you could see that he, we are stopping too frequently. Almost out of 10 white men, five will ask him to stop, to have a look at his car, to compliment him. But you can see that they are doing that with a certain, the, the entire sort of interaction is changed with something other than equals, you know, like someone complimenting you on your car. There's actually something else happening there. So that was one of my first uh, sort of instances now of uh, racism, as I remember it then. And there, obviously there will have been more after that. And you moved from Bochfontein Farm to the Rotunda Township in the south of Heidelberg. Tell us more about your transition from a farm boy to a township boy. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a bit of an adventure of sorts because uh, farm life is obviously a lot more laid back. There's space. Next neighbor's house is, is uh, more than 500 meters away. There are animals. My mother kept chicken. And moving to a township was uh, obviously different in that you now are living in a more dense sort of space. And um, uh, you have to share, in some instances, not necessarily by choice. And at that time, and I think it still remains the case today, there was a, a bit of a divide, right, in between the urban guys and the farm guys, right? So you could say up to the age of six, I was a farm guy. So transitioning now into becoming a township boy, those first few months were, were difficult from that standpoint because the guys would always be teasing and, uh, and actually getting grips to other languages, Zulu in particular, uh, a bit of Africans there. 
some you know boys at that age also getting into fights yeah so it was it was it was exactly i would call it an an adventure actually can you briefly share with us more about the fateful day policemen raided your house saying an anonymous caller called to say you are selling daha and men drugs in the community yeah hey, that day was was also early morning uh, my brother has a friend that comes in every morning around 8 or so i think it was around the time that now i'm studying with unisa so as you would know you wake up and study so i wake up uh, but my brother and his friend have already woken up and they're in the room adjacent to mine. And uh, I hear that there are people talking on that side of the room that they want to come in, right? And I hear my brother kind of protesting that, no, no, but you, you can't just come in. You know, I think he's maybe have watched too many movies. So he's asking for things like, do you have warrants? Uh, you know, you cannot just budge in here. <laughs> and then eventually him and two police officers appear at my door. And when they appear, I'm about maybe 20 at the time, 2021. 20, so they get into the door and you can see that the officers are a little surprised themselves that, okay, so now this is the guy who we've come to get. Is this really him? Um, and my brother explains that, you see, that's, that's actually the guy that you've come to arrest. And later when we look outside, we find actually that there are about 16 vehicles there, others parked in the street adjacent, front of the house, there are actually cops everywhere. And it's really, I think at that time, very surprising because you, you're a bit of a nerd in a way, right? I, I don't think, oh, well, Ned can do these things, obviously, but it, it was really, really, really surprising. And I think it's also one of the, I would say, instances now of a newer kind of discrimination, if you like, because you might say the entire book is about things like racism, but there are also instances of very intense discrimination in between Africans. And in many instances, things like the law or law enforcement uh, agencies are actually being, will be used. I think it's a microcosm perhaps at that time that I'm a very small or very, very, I mean, in the whole scope of crime in South Africa, I'm probably nothing, right? But you can already see that someone has managed to create a bit of confusion, a bit of turmoil around me. And he has used something official like the police force to do that. Because I actually think it was an instance of just someone wanting to, uh, to embarrass me a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit more, I guess, yeah. And talking about discrimination, can you briefly share with us your encounter with Subigazi Jordan at Cousins Manamela Personal Agency when you were there for an interview? I think that incident is actually, I had them talking about similar things on the radio here about this whole thing about experience, right? I think Clement Manyatela was citing a recent, uh, I think, Employment Commission report or whatever. So they are citing the statistics uh, as to what is the level of transformation, how many Africans in certain in senior positions in particular, right? And they are finding that really things haven't changed. And one listener phoned in and said, the whole thing that will actually make sure that that kind of discrimination against Blacks in particular persists in the corporate world is this whole experience thing. Because at that time when I made uh, contact with Shubikaz, she, she had advertised a role that required someone with no experience, but a BCom degree with information systems, right? I had a BCom degree with information systems. And in fact, a couple of maybe one or two years of work experience now, right? And the role required no experience. But when you get there, she suddenly doesn't, uh, uh, and it, it's very, and I think it, it actually shows you the amount of nerve 
because I think people know that if you're looking for work, in many instances, you might be willing to take something other than what you've come for, right? So as soon as I get there, suddenly she's talking about another role uh, that is uh, more suitable. And ultimately that role isn't really, let's call it suitable. It's, it's a role that serves more the company than myself, right? But she's actually helping to do that in effect because the least she could have done is to say, well, maybe that role is no longer available, which would have obviously been a lie because that's the role I responded to in my uh, sort of interactions with her telephonically. The understanding had always been that that's what I'm coming in for. But immediately we come there. And in those years in particular, I mean, you saw that quite a lot in my um, sort of experience at APSA, for example, a couple of years before, you'd always see that, okay, I'm matriculant with a matriculation exemption, I'm 20. There's another 20 year old, maybe even without a matriculation exemption, but he's of a different background. He goes straight into a permanent role and you can see within two, three years, he's actually being parachuted into more senior roles. But that will obviously never happen with you. I think those sort of things continue to happen. I think, uh, as I'm saying, a recent report, actually, it's still horrible reading if you're Black and African. And in your last chapter of the book, you state that an African with an education remains far less deserving of the full fruits of his labor than a hardworking and ambitious white man without one. So do you think race still plays an important role in acquiring jobs in the country? No, absolutely. Um, actually, that part of that page, that last page that you're citing there, it has made me think of one particular line in the Bible where it is said that one particular race will forever be hewers of wood and drawers of water, right? I think that captures exactly what that kind of discrimination um, is like, right? Because if you are black, I think you have to prove yourself. And in fact, even when you've walked into a room, even when you've begun to perform, you effectively continue to prove yourself, right? But on the other side of the uh, sort of equation, the eyes are actually, it's almost as if it is expected that certain groups will be in certain roles and then others in, in, in other roles, maybe the less prefer preferable roles. And so I don't think I'm actually, by saying this, saying anything remarkably revealing or, you know, it's, it's actually, that's how it is. There are studies that actually show that things may actually have worsened in some regard, in that if you're young today, if you're like, let's say under 25, you probably face significantly more challenges to get a foothold in the workplace and, and build a career therefore, right? Uh, than it might have been maybe in the early, into the early late 90s when I began to work. So, so yes, it's, it's really, really, really sad that uh, in fact, maybe today, right, with the qualifications that I have, I feel there are not many jobs that I cannot do or learn to do eventually, right? You will actually find when you, when you make the applications that that's not what is being considered. Lastly, in the States, as an example, what people will do to just prove uh, this, this little thing we're talking about, they literally have a CV, change the name of the, the applicant, right, at the top of that CV and make it, let's say, white, right? Make it uh, Michael uh, Anderson, right? Not Tabo Mulefe, same CV. Submit the, the CV with Tawa Mulefe, get a wholly different response. Submit the same CV with Michael Anderson, get a wholly different response. In fact, get Michael Anderson calling Tabo and saying, hey, man, I got it. So what's, what's, what's happening there? So yes, I think it, it still goes on. 
And lastly, what do you hope people take away after reading your book? Uh, what I hope people take away is that uh, they should also reflect, right, as I've done. And to the extent that it is possible for them to, to learn something useful for their lives in their book, from the book, uh, they should do so. But similarly, they should also share uh, instances of same things that I maybe have faced in the book. But I should say that maybe beyond some of the negative things that the book uh, kind of touches upon, the good, the good things as well. Uh, because I think, Tabi, we probably don't get to make as much emphasis uh, about the good things, the, the progressive and progress uh, that has actually come from, from, from living in, in South Africa. Uh, so perhaps what I'm saying is that it is ultimately a mixed bag, right? It is not entirely uh, doom and gloom. There is a lot of good still in South Africa and being black in South Africa, in fact, but obviously there, are, there still remains uh, lots of areas of improvement. That was Thabo Mulefe speaking to Prima Media's polity about native boys.